Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to our study in the book of Zechariah, shall we not seek our Heavenly Father for his blessing and his guidance? Shall we not ask for the impartation of his wisdom and for him to show us that which we need to know at this time? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, <clears throat> we come before you on this Sabbath with grateful hearts for the Sabbath, for the rest that is offered. We ask now, Father, for your direction and for your blessing. We ask for your guidance <clears throat> so that as we open the word that you have provided us, so as we open the word of your prophet, we may see clearly <clears throat> that which we need to understand. Father, we have sinned. We have great need of you. We ask now for your direction and for your guidance. Please be with us, each one. Direct us in all that you would have us to do. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to draw closer to you. To understand that which we need to know. Direct our steps. Direct our thoughts. Direct our words. So that all may be done to your glory. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we are returning to the study in the book of Zechariah, we're going to recap a brief bit from two weeks ago and go forward. There is also going to be another document that I was led to read that I will share with you. Satan was charging the people of God with all of his attributes and presenting before him, before them, the sins that he had instigated them to commit. Satan clothed their characters with his own filthy garments of sin, and nothing was lost in his reckoning of their misdeeds. But these souls who were represented as wearing the black robes of Satan's weaving in his hellish loom, were not as appropriate representation, for they had repented of their transgressions. We are being shown over and over again. Okay, so it says not as appropriate. Shouldn't it be not an appropriate or not an appropriate representation? I think there must be a typo in the in the on the website or whatever. I, I'm not going to disagree with your point, but at this point, this is the way that I found it. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying it looks like a typo. Typos happen quite a bit with the EG White Estates. I think that we've seen quite a few examples of this. Yeah. But you got this off the website or the disc? I got this off the website. Okay. Okay. The, Lord, the Lord who searches the hearts and understandeth the imaginations of the thoughts and set their sins before them and had given them the promise, if thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. First Chronicles 28.9. The Lord, the everlasting God, is ever present to observe, to inspect, and examine all things. Excuse me. Now, what do we see here? The Lord observes. He inspects. And he examines. 
I find in this a refutation of those that would seek to say that there is no investigative judgment. My apology. The hearts of all are read as an open book. Now, does that mean that that we can hide anything from our Heavenly Father? Does that mean that there's anything secret that is kept from him? The eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth. Second Chronicles 16.9 God's people rescued from the fire by Jesus Christ have a sense of their sins and they feel humble and ashamed. There are many times that we will be faced where the adversary is going to continue to say to us, you have sinned, you are not worthy. Yet, here, we are to accept that, that we will indeed have a sense of our sins. And yet, as we are humbled and ashamed, we know that we can cling to Christ. For he is our hope everlasting. God sees and recognizes their repentance and notes their sorrow for sin, which they cannot remove or cancel themselves. But as they pray, their prayers are heard, and this is the reason that Satan stands by to resist Christ, because he hears their prayers and he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He regenerates the sinner and pardon is written off against his name. Now, this stirs up Satan to resistance. <clears throat> How many times have we provided a witness to those that Satan views as his? And then have we felt the anger and the enmity that he has against any of those that would stand for Christ. He steps in between the repenting, believing soul and Christ. So our adversary steps in between our advocate and between he who is our advocate before the Father. He seeks to cast his, cast his hellish shadow before that soul to dampen faith and to make of none effect the words of God. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. Let my light and my righteousness shine into his heart. Now, <clears throat> many times, We are presented with situations that are tests for us. Are we willing to praise God in all things? Are we willing, even when we are given the worst news, to say thank you that I know my Redeemer lives. If Satan stands between the soul and Jesus Christ, then the love and the acceptance and the pardon of Christ is eclipsed. <clears throat> what does it mean to you that the pardon of Christ is eclipsed. 
Is it not darkened? Mm -hmm. Man will be constantly striving to prepare a robe of righteousness to cover his de deformity and sin. Can we be seen as righteous by a robe of our own making? No. When Christ wants him to come to him just as he is and believe in him as his personal savior and his tender love of forgiving father brings forth his best robe in which to array his returning child. Now, in this, we know the parable well. This son had walked away from his father. This son had gone into another country. This son had squandered his inheritance, had squandered his character, had squandered all of the gifts that the father had given him. Yet when he is returned, when the prodigal is yet afar off, what does the father do? Here is the father coming to meet us while we are yet far away. Here is the father bringing his best robe. Here is the father bringing the signet ring. Here is the father showing his love for his child. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, that is, the angels that do his bidding, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. I will clothe thee with a change of raiment, and I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. And they clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Joshua represents all of God's people who repent and believe. And accept of Christ as their sin pardoning savior. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, if you will keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house and shall also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Zechariah 3, 3 to 7. Now, in letter 78, yeah. I mean, go ahead. Yeah, so just going back to um, Satan's resistance. Yes. Um, I mean, the main motivation that Satan has is we know that in the sanctuary service on the Day of Atonement, the sins that have gone beforehand to judgment and have been blotted out will be placed upon Satan. It is, however it works or however it operates, it's represented in the sanctuary that, that Satan will bear the responsibility for being the instigator of sin. But only those sins which people themselves are not bearing the responsibility for. That is, the wicked who don't take advantage and utilize the, the forgiveness uh, and Christ's righteousness. They bear their own responsibility for their sins. Satan doesn't bear the responsibility for their sins, is my understanding. Just the sins of, of the righteous that he caused them to commit. Correct. Which, um, you know, this is not well understood within Christianity, of course, but, um, you know, this is part of Satan's motivation in, in why he's, he's causing others to sin. I mean, he a, is, you know, he hates God and wants to do everything to counteract what God is doing that is good. So his character is antithetical to Christ's. <clears throat> but um, uh, understanding the significance of the scapegoat 
um, really helps us understand the whole issue of the great controversy. So it's, um, you know, it's an important point, but, but it's Satan's resistance. I mean, his anger, his hatred is, and I don't understand how he, how it's different for him. You know, let's say there was, you know, less righteous or more righteous, whether that would make his punishment worse or not. But he seems to, at least that's what in the scripture, it, it represents that the more that are saved, the greater his punishment, in a sense. It's just kind of an interesting concept. I'm not really sure, understand how that is. You would think he'd just be punished, you know, just for being the instigator of sin. Just that's the punishment. But being punished for sins that have been forgiven, there must be something, some principle that I'm not, I haven't been able to figure it out. So anyway, that's just some thoughts. Maybe somebody has ideas about that. Any other thoughts, brothers, sisters? One thing that I'm learning, like I'm just reviewing because I missed most of the reading of A.T. Jones. I was just exhausted. I flaked out and I just gave up trying to trying to absorb it. But now I realize if I have innately the mind of Christ that's battling against my carnal mind, then why don't I work more on consenting not to give place to all these impulses and everything else that comes my way. And I'm thinking, I can have the mastery over these temptations and these impulses and these sinful urges just by relying more on Christ. I mean, it's so deep and yet it's so simple. I thought it's taken me 70 plus years to, to really start cluing into this. Like it's becoming more conscious with me now. And it's just amazing, you know, like I have to keep reviewing this and reviewing this and getting more and more out of it because it's just astonishing the power that is available to us through Christ. And yet we haven't, I know I haven't been fully availing this. I haven't really believed that I could have that victory through him. I'm just too busy looking at my faults and my flaws and my weaknesses and, and these illnesses and everything else. And no. He's already overcome that. Yeah. So why don't I walk in the belief that he has overcome in my behalf and step right into that? Right. Instead of, I mean, because we can often focus upon, and we can think it's actually a righteous thing, right? We focus upon our sins. We talk about how, you know, our past sin life or the struggles that we're having. And yet Ellen White's quite clear that, um, we need to focus upon what Christ has accomplished for us. We expect to see ourselves as sinners. We are weak. We're burdened. We're heavy laden with sins. But that's not to be our conversation or our thoughts. Our focus needs to be upon what Christ has accomplished and to trust in his righteousness. And part of the thing I take about the fil filthy rags being removed from us Um you know, because we have seen this view in Adventism where Christ just places uh, the garment of his righteousness over our filthy garments. I've heard that many places, um, even though it's quite clear in the Bible and spirit of prophecy that he cannot place his garment of righteousness over our filthy garments. They have to be removed. Um, but if you think about it, if you just think about what you're talking about there, Angela, as as an illustration, focusing upon. You know, our health problems, our sin problems, uh, the failures we experience in our life. There's no way that Christ can just cover over those things. They have to be addressed. But the way that they are, are addressed, um, it's not just by ignoring them, right? So it's not this other thing of just ignoring the reality. They have to be removed. And that's a work of cooperation with Christ, just as much as um, um, any any work of cooperating with Christ, anything that we do in yoking up with him, we're learning of him. But we know the garment of his righteousness 
has not in it one thread of human devising. So this garment of his righteousness has nothing to do with our righteousness or our goodness. So he has to remove our sins from us and clothe us with a change of raiment, this new character. So, so I understand what you're saying there. At least I hope I do. Yeah, and it's the old Catholic thing too, right? Well, you have to earn the merits, you know, by suffering, yeah. by this and that. So there's so much of this garbage that I have to get rid of to say, no, Jesus promised this. And even though I know that on one level, to be fully infused with that, that's the battle right now. I just say, Lord, I have to accept it. Your word says so. Your word says this, I just have to accept it. And it was like a, a battle I had trying to accept the true the true state, state of the dead, right? That was my biggest battle when I became an SDA or when I was becoming an SDA. How could this be when blah, 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 blah. And I said, no, your word says this, therefore I accept it. Yeah. So first Corinthians 15. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay, Dwight. Okay. Now, as we've continued to look at this, Mrs. White had another document in 1894 where she gives reference again to Zechariah 3. Dear brethren in responsible positions in the Review and Herald office, I am much pleased that you have restored Henry Kellogg to his old position who I trust is born again, not of the flesh, but of the Spirit of God. I greatly feared that his long separation from the work would disqualify him to stand in the position he is now occupying. But if the Lord has indeed accepted him, and I know he is always ready to accept any soul <clears throat> who will return from his wanderings and accept Jesus Christ, he will be qualified to do the work which God has called him. The arms of Jesus are open to accept him, and he is willing to bless and to teach him. He will realize the force of the word of Christ spoke to, jo to Joshua, the high priest. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, For if thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, and the Lord is has in his messages shown what his charge is. Then thou shalt also keep my house, and shalt also keep my court, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to share a different document. Here again in 1908, <clears throat> Mrs. White gave a very specific warning. As you can see in the title, this is warning against lending aid to the enemy. Because this has the nomenclature here of NP, November Papa, this is a non-published article, and the Ellen White estate notes that it was previously unpublished. Yesterday and this morning, I've had a message to give to our brethren. I was in a gathering of people, and there were collected in groups persons who were dwelling on certain things, and they were questioning the reliability of some things in my early experience, which they thought were in error. It is not for us to question or condemn these experiences that Mrs. White had. Neither are we supposed to be in condemnation of other brothers and sisters. One drew near and listened attentively to the words spoke to. All understood he was a man of authority. He said, your words are not called for. Questioning is not timely, nor wise, nor just. 
Can you not see all this issue you are bringing in is untimely? Can you judge righteously on this subject? Who gave you this burden? Not the Lord. It is certain to create an issue to put into the hands of your opponents. Can you not read from cause to effect? The matter of difficulty is not to be talked of or dwelt upon, for it creates an issue and you get this interwoven with your labors. The very work that has been so long neglected to give the message of Bible truth, which is vital to the souls of the people, will be neglected still. The enemy will work to great advantage. This question is on a subject that in no wise concerns the salvation of souls as a test question. Silence on your part is eloquence. The testing truth for this time is to be made straight and plain before the people with clear, determined voice. There is now a decided work to be done. There is a company who are not doing the work which should be their burden. The message is yet to be given in all the cities of the South. For today, I would almost have to think that this message is yet to be given in all cities. Do not place before the mind a question that will, if agitated, cause division at the very heart of the work. Let your burden be to reach souls. Now, I'm going to skip a paragraph. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Is that is that is that part of what she was telling Brother Daniels, where he was um, bringing in the daily? Well, let us let us be very clear. When Brother Daniels was addressing the daily, what did Mrs. White have to say to him specifically about the daily? That it didn't need to be agitated. It didn't need to be brought before the people. Okay. Now, while your statement is correct, Mrs. White was very clear in relation to the daily that there was a time when all were united on the subject of the daily. Right. right. And at that time, when all were united, what was the definition that was given on the daily? It was paganism. Right? Yes. And what was Elder Daniels attempting to say about the daily that it was Christ right it, it was it it was Christ's sanctuary it was Christ in his service in the sanctuary. sanctuary right so elder daniels was agitating a view that had come from the angels that were expelled from heaven right right okay is this not the view that is currently being presented before the people today? Yes, it is. And here is the sad thing, as I have noted. This view is also being presented within the Ellen White Study Bible as being published by Andrews University. I didn't our, know that. Our people are well asleep. They are accepting the words of men over the words of God. So, yes, I would have to think that she was being very clear that rather than stating that the daily was paganism, that Elder Daniels was presenting this as Christ's service 
in the heavenly sanctuary in a manner to confuse other brothers and sisters. Okay. Does that answer your question, brother? Yes, it does. I, the reason I brought it up because I heard, you know, you when you read that quote, you, it was talking about the the silence is eloquently. Yes. And that, and that took my mind back to the daily, you know. So that's the reason I brought it up. Right. And that's an excellent point. Thank you. I am to warn our people, give the enemies no opportunity to be furnished by you with a questioning doubts of the work that the Lord is doing through the testimonies. Now, it's interesting, since this was published in 1908. If we were to go back, of course, to 1880 through 1884, we had Uriah Smith and Elder Butler that were questioning the work that was being done through the testimonies. In fact, Uriah Smith made it very clear that only when Mrs. White is having a public vision is that from God. And that when she publishes the testimonies, that this is her opinion. God has not laid on any man this subject. The great subject now is the commandments of God. When were the commandments given? Were they not given at Sinai? Were they not given in a single day? Was not the covenant that our Heavenly Father offered with Israel given on that day? I was referred to Isaiah chapters 48. 51, 52, 58, and 60. These chapters should stir the souls of the people. Carry these things in your mind and seek the Lord and work the works so essential to be done. But give not yourselves into the hands of the enemy, for you have not the spiritual strength that you need. Keep out every question that is not of vital interest to the saving of souls. Christ's ministry in the most holy, which is not the daily, is a question for people to be able to understand, to be able to affix their faith where Christ is working on our behalf. Other questions will be thrust in that will set minds upon a train that will give the enemies of our faith great rejoicing. And those who are wise need to keep before the people the great issues that determine the soul's salvation. Let every soul connected with the work in your conference take time to pray to the Lord. And if they individually desire to have physical health, let them discard all meat eating and tea drinking and eat simple food of a kind to strengthen the physical and the mental powers. Now, this admonition is very blunt. And there are many that would prefer not to have to hear such a blunt comment. Now, I'm going to skip a few more, but I want you to follow through. I will make sure that this document is sent on so that you'll be able to read the entire document for yourself. Elder Cottrell, 
The Lord calls upon you to help Elder Astle in every way possible. For unless the converting power of God shall mold and fashion Elder Knox and Elder Corliss after the divine similitude, their influence will not be a saving influence. There are men who have been long in the truth, but whose ministration of the truth is perverted. Jeremiah 5, 1 to 5. Jeremiah 7, 1 to 7. The end is near. The judgments of God are now in the land. And San Francisco is a living testimony to the condition of our world. And now, with all this before the men who have served, there has been administration that would, if continued, make the testimony of make the testimony God has given a matter of naught. Are we to set aside the testimonies in any manner? No. Okay. The great things to take place are before us, and we who are all living shall see to the end of these judgments which are before us in San Francisco. We can say concerning San Francisco and the many places where the judgments of God have been witnessed that they are a standing warning to the people in Oakland, opening to them what Daniel in vision saw would be. Now, I find that I found this very interesting. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which is told, is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be many days. Now, when she is bringing this to our remembrance in the book of Daniel, the first vision that Daniel is referencing is the evening and the morning which is told is true. We call that the 2300 days. What is the second vision that she is referring to? The Kazan the Kazan vision. Yes. And as we as we were covering this last week in the camp meeting, this is not only the Kazon vision, it is also the vision of the daily and the transgression of desolation. For that is how it's presented using Daniel 8.13. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterwards, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, and none understood it. And I, and I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes, and I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. See Daniel 9, 3 to 19. When we are looking at this, we have been given the admonition by Sister White that the, quote, minor prophets are to be studied in conjunction with the book of Daniel. As we have been studying these many Sabbaths on the minor prophets, we have been preparing for the time that we are going to need to spend within the book of Daniel for us to be able to more rightly divide the word of truth. Let all who have a careless disposition in spiritual things come to their senses. We are the people concerned in these things in our world, and no soul is to take up suppositions and make them definitions of the word that shall confuse the people of God 
and do more harm than our enemies. We read, now, to be honest here, I have been being asked, of what use is it to give reference to Palmoni, the wonderful number? The comment that was made back to me very specifically is, why are you worrying about this when we need to be telling people more about the love of God? Palmoni is in the Bible. Palmoni is Christ. As we continue here in reading from Daniel, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years. Wherefore, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Daniel 9, 1 to 3. Here we have the source of Daniel's wisdom. He sought the Lord. He could not confine himself to the king's business, but he was speaking with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Daniel had communion with God. Is this not what we should be seeking for ourselves today? Communion with God? The address of Daniel to God was in the Lord's keeping before he was cast into the lion's den. The one special duty of Daniel was to keep close to his duty in prayer, although under the decree that if any man made a prayer to God, he should be cast into the lion's den. A promise had been made. After 70 years, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you. Jeremiah 29.10 Though Daniel was himself a prophet, yet he consulted the scriptural record found in the books. He understood by books that 70 years was the time fixed for the continuance of the desolation of Jerusalem. The book was the prophecies of Jeremiah. God had said, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you. Jeremiah 29.10 Though Daniel himself was a great prophet, well acquainted with the visions of God, yet he was a diligent searcher of the scriptures he thought it wise to consult Jeremiah's prophecies, and he prayed to God aloud most earnestly. Please note a couple of things. Here, Mrs. White is is recognizing Daniel is a prophet, but she also calls him a great prophet. Now, there are many places within Scripture where we find a definition where the word word is used. And many times this definition is commandment. Has our, had our father given a commandment that Jerusalem was going to lay desolate. And here, God has said, I will visit you and perform my good 
commandment toward you. Yeah, in Hebrew, that's the word debar. So it has a, a variety of meaning, but definitely the idea of a commandment is a word. That it is, it's something that's, it's a spoken commandment. Is God capable of keeping his commandments? Well, he keeps his word. Exactly. So when we are giving reference to the commandments of God and we are observing the covenant that he offered with the children of Israel that we can find in Exodus 20 through chapter 23. God is saying to us that he is capable he is willing and he is able to do exactly what he promises. It is up to us to trust. Here is Daniel. Mrs. White says he was a prophet. Yes. She also says he was a great prophet and that he was well acquainted with the visions of God, whether we're talking the calzone, the mare, or the mara, and any other vision. Yet Daniel was led to search the scriptures more diligently. We are to learn the lessons God has given us, and to seek the Lord and to understand. Great things are before us, and if the enemy can obtain access to minds, to undermine the testimonies God has given me in my youth, he will make every word the minister shall speak as a voice to create doubt. Unless they shall seek the Lord and become sanctified in speech and in their hearts, they will be left in darkness. Daniel 10. Take notes. Take Notice of verses 20 and 21. So if we were to look at this from Daniel 10. And we were to note verses 20 and 21. We are told. Then said he. Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee. And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee, which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Are we seeking to be left in darkness? Is this the desire of our heart? Or are we seeking to let the light so shine that we may stand before men to give an answer for the faith that is within us? Here are the heavenly powers in connection with the earthly. Then said he, then said Gabriel, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. There are heavenly agencies communing with the earthly to reveal that which shall take place. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, whom I had seen with the daily and the transgression of desolation 
at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Daniel 9, 20 to 22. Now, in looking at Testimony 9, the original testimony that you would find in First Testimonies, Mrs. White said the following. I was again shown Martin Luther. God raised him up to do a special work. How precious was the knowledge of truth revealed in the word of God to Luther. His mind was starving for something sure upon which to build his hope that God would be his father and heaven his home. The new and precious light which dawned upon him from the word of God was of priceless value. He thought if he went forth with it, he could convince the world. He stood up against the ire of a fallen church and strengthened those who were with him, were feasting upon the rich truths contained in the word of God. Luther was God's chosen instrument to tear off the garb of hypocrisy from the papal church and expose her corruption. He raised his voice zealously and in the power of the Holy Spirit cried out against and rebuked the existing sins of the leaders of the people. He counted not his life dear unto him. Proclamations went forth to kill Luther anywhere he might be found. He seemed left to the mercies of a superstitious people who were obedient to the head of the Roman church. Luther knew that he was not safe anywhere, yet he trembled not. The light he saw and feasted upon was life, life to him, and was of more value than all the treasures of earth. Earthly treasures he knew would fail, but the rich truth opened to his understanding, operating upon his heart, would live, and if obeyed, would lead him to immortality. Here was one lone man who had stirred the rage of the priests and the people. He was summoned to Augsburg to answer for his faith. He obeyed the summons. Firm and undaunted, he stood before those who had caused the world to tremble. A meek lamb surrounded by angry lions. Yet for the truth's sake and for Christ's sake, he stood up undaunted and with holy eloquence which truth alone can inspire, he gave the reasons of his faith. Mrs. White made the comment, silence is eloquence. Yet here is Luther speaking with holy eloquence. They tried various measures to silence the bold advocate for truth. They flattered and they held out inducements. They tried to bribe him. He should be exalted and honored, but life and honors were valueless to him if purchased at the sacrifice of the truth. Brighter and clearer shone the word of God upon his understanding, giving him a more vivid sense of the errors, of the corruptions, and the hypocrisy of the papacy. His enemy sought to intimidate him and cause him to renounce his faith, but he boldly stood in the defense of the truth. He was ready to die for his faith, if God required, but to yield it, never. God preserved his life. He bade angels attend him and bring him through the stormy conflict, unharmed, and he baffled the rage and the purposes of his enemies. The calm, dignified power of Luther humbled his enemies and dealt a most dreadful blow to the papacy. The great and proud man in power meant he should alone or atone by his blood for the mischief he had done. Their plans were laid, but a mightier than they had charge of Luther. His work was not finished.
the friends of Luther hastened his departure from Augsburg. He leaves in the night, mounted upon a horse, without a bridle, without boots, without spurs, and was unarmed. With great weariness, he performs his journey until he is among his friends. Again, Mrs. White was very clear. Silence is eloquence. But when God bids us to speak, if we are speaking his words in the manner that he would have them presented, are we then to keep silent? Zechariah 3.8 Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Now, in these situations, whenever there is a little symbol like this, this cross, we have an alternate. Here it is the Hebrew of wonder or sign, as we would see in Ezekiel 12, 11 and 24, 24. Say, I am your sign, like as I have done. So shall it be done unto them. They shall remove and go into captivity. Along with. Thus, Ezekiel is unto you a sign, according to all that he hath done shall ye do. And when this cometh, ye shall know that I am the Lord. Would you present the weakness and mistakes of the dead before a world that is greedily watching for any semblance of a chance to make the Lord's chosen people appear in defiled garments? Are we to criticize and tear down other brothers and sisters? No. Remember that God claims these men as his. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments in going over to the side of the accuser. So if we're choosing to stand in these garments of our own making, these defiled garments, are we not then standing on the side of the accuser? Is this not what Mrs. White is saying to us today? Encouragement goes a long way. Yes, doesn't it, though? And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh in the last great conflict, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Revelation 3, 4 and 5. Again, we return to Zechariah 3. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, in the present time of probation, then they, thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts. And I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Zechariah 3, 6 and 7. When are we to walk in his ways? When are we to keep the charge of the Lord? In this present time 
of probation. Those who stand by are not only evil angels who confederate with evil men, stirring them up to annoy and to perplex and destroy the people of God. But there are also angels that excel in strength who surround the believing ones, who stand in vindication of the law of God. God is the protection of the faithful ones. They shall have a place to walk among them that stand by. They shall be firm in God, standing in their lot, and placed to obey God at the loss of all things else. See Isaiah 58, 8 through 14. Though Satan's deceptions are a breach, through Satan's deceptions are a breach that has been made into the law of God. But God has a loyal people, few in number, who will not trample upon the Sabbath, who will build up the old waste places and raise up the fountains of many generations, which is the memorial God has given for man to observe through time and through eternity. They work in Christ's lines, not speaking their own words or doing their own pleasure on my holy day, saith the Lord. Isaiah 58, 13. They worship God on the holy Sabbath and God has written their names in heaven as repairers of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Now, all the people of God who are advocating his holy law are brought distinctly before us in the prophecy concerning Joshua and the angel. Now, does that mean that in obeying this holy law, that we are confined only to obeying the Ten Commandments? Are we not to keep the covenant that God has presented, the entire covenant, as part of keeping the law? Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee. For they are men wondered at, for behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Zechariah 3.8. Let us fear and tremble at the very thought of speaking light concerning the name and the experience of those who are sleeping in Jesus. Speak one word that shall lead anyone to disparage them, and it is recorded in the books of heaven as spoken against Christ in the person of his saints whose lives are hid with Christ in God. When you give over these precious ones, the dead or the living, to be maligned by false and wicked tongues, God will hold you to an account for these things. For thus saith the High and Holy One that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah 57, 15. Again, those that would choose to make use of a wicked tongue to malign other brothers and sisters are doing the work of the adversary. Zechariah 3 9. For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving set thereof, saith the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day.
Zechariah 3.10. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. Okay, I'll read this comment from the chat. Regarding signs and wonders, Isaiah 8.18 especially, and verses 1 to 4. Are we not the spiritual children of the prophets and of Christ as we learn to live in accord with his and their words? Are these meant to be signs to the world in these last days? What do you, what do you think and what do you say? Who else was it found under the vine and under the fig tree? Do we not have the example of one of the disciples being found praying under the fig tree? Wasn't that the uh, tax collector? But I don't think it was. I think this was Nathaniel. <clears throat> okay. All right. Yeah, that's right. The uh, tax collector was up in the tree. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that's Zacchaeus up in the tree. Yeah, right. Yeah. So. If we were to turn to John 1, 43 to 51. So John 1, 43 to 51. Begins saying. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and said unto him, follow me. Now, Philip with, was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there be any good thing that cometh out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Nathanael answered, Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel. Now, in this situation, Nathaniel is given evidence. He is being told that he recognized that his prayer was being answered. Philip was calling his friend. He was aware that Nathaniel had been praying and had been studying under the fig tree. What symbols can we derive from those that are under the vine and under the fig tree? 
Brother Dwight, you 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 uh you see the promise God made him in fifty one and fifty I mean fifty and fifty one. Why don't you expand on that for me, brother? He said, G and Jesus said, answered and said unto him, because I say unto thee, I saw thee under a the fig tree. Believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So he told Nathaniel that he was gonna that he was gonna see the Son of God descending and the angels descending and descending on the Son of God. Right. Son of Man. So how do we relate this verse with everything else that we have been reading? from Zechariah 3. How are we to look at this for today? Brother William's point is well taken because Christ is telling Nathaniel, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree. Because Christ recognized where he was praying. That Nathaniel was willing to believe. Did Nathaniel require a miracle in order to believe? No. Did he require to hear that God the Father had sent his spirit upon Christ at his baptism? Who was it that witnessed not only the dove descending, but heard the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. John the yes. Baptist. Exactly, brothers. John the Baptist. Yet, when John was put in prison, what happened? He doubted God. Yes, he did. How did he doubt God? He sent his disciples to inquire him whether he was a son of God sent to, to them. Are ye whom is written in the scriptures, or shall we look for another? Yes. Are we to have that kind of faith, or are we to have the kind of faith that requires no miracle? Say no miracle. Because yeah. everybody's looking for a miracle nowadays. Exactly. Many years ago, there was a friend that made the comment that if these were truly the last days, why are no miracles being performed? Do we. Miracles? Excuse me? That's the miracles in the hearts of people. Yes. That's the miracles. But they, they are miracles. They have miracles, but they just don't see them. Yeah. Every day we are seeing answers to prayer. Is that not a miracle in and of itself? Yeah, definitely. Amen. So, here we have the people of God. Here we have Christ 
willing to remove our filthy garments in exchange for his righteousness. We are being offered the removal of the character that we think is perfect to be able to receive the character that is perfect. We know that our adversary wants us to fail. We know that our adversary wants us to doubt God. With all the evidences that he had received, John the Baptist doubted that Christ was actually the Messiah. With all the evidences that he had seen standing on Mount Carmel, Elijah, who slew the priests of Baal and the priests of the grove, and who ran before the chariot, the very chariot of Ahab, to guide it, when he was able to fall asleep, did he not doubt that God was able to protect him from the rantings of a wicked woman? From the chat, could John 151 be also a message to us that there among us are some who will be among the 144,000 who are still alive when Jesus returns in glory? This is our aim. But if some of us are sleeping in him before his coming, we have hope of seeing him at the resurrection of the righteous. Is it possible that this prophecy is presented for us to apply today? What would you think? Okay, from the chat, it says it's possible. So now, from Zechariah 3. And it, it wouldn't it also take you back to Jacob? Jacob okay. sleeping and seeing um, in his dream angels descending and Ascending. And ascending, yes. I could agree with that. So now, here we have Zechariah 3 that has been presented for us to consider. There is much more for us to look at within the book of Zechariah. We are going to be looking at this further as we begin to look further into the rest of this prophet's work and compare this with the book of Daniel. That's been our goal, to go through these so-called minor prophets. So we may then enter in to a study in the book of Daniel to learn more fully what Daniel would have us to see at this time. Now, do we have any other questions or comments with what we've covered today?
Mike, any other thoughts? And there's been several very good thoughts today. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I just want to comment on uh, John, uh, John chapter 1. Okay. To do with uh, angels descending and descending on the ladder. Yes. Because we found that uh, Christ is the one who's uh, connecting heaven and earth on the cross. Right. Because uh, he's the only one, yeah. That is the reason even uh, why Jacob uh, saw angels uh, on the ladder because Christ is the only one. We we went away and uh, he came here so that uh, he takes us back to the Father. Okay. Anyone else? All right. <clears throat> we do have a few minutes left of our time today. However, we will close a bit early. So shall we thank our Heavenly Father for this which he has, has presented before us for our consideration. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you have been doing. We thank you for the lessons that you have been providing and for the guidance that you are giving. Direct us now. May that which we do Glorify your character, glorify your name, and be according to your will. Help us now. Show us that that you would have us to understand. Be with us through this day so that that which we do shall lift you up. so that others may see your glory. For this, we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.